Hi, everyone, and welcome to the first session of the Faculty of Health Science Program for Faculty Development's chat series. Tonight's session of Women's Conversations in Healthcare, Academia, and Teaching is focused on building your squad. We'll be discussing sponsorship, mentorship, and allyship within the context of not just academia, but all sectors represented by our attendees tonight. My name is Sarah Lau, and I'm a faculty member at the Michael G. DeGroote School of Medicine. I'm joined here by my friend, colleague, and co-host, Dr. Teresa Chan, who's the Assistant Dean for the Program of Faculty Development. We're so excited to have you here tonight. A quick rundown of our evening. We'll be starting out with some opening remarks by our guest of honor, Rebecca Ripa, the EVP of Clinical Support and Performance at the University Health Network in Toronto. Once Rebecca gets us in the frame of mind for our evening, we'll spend most of tonight in small groups discussing what sponsorship, mentorship, and allyship have meant to us and how we can use these to empower ourselves and others in our networks. We'll conclude with summarizing our takeaways and committing to an action for tomorrow so we can put our learnings into practice as soon as we leave the session. So why women's conversations in healthcare, academia, and teaching? Why talk about mentorship, sponsorship, and allyship? Well, there's a persistent gender gap in academia, especially when it comes to leadership roles. These are traditionally male-dominated, and the culture in universities and many other organizations will still largely favor the progression of men. Very often, men are rewarded for the very assertiveness, ambition, and outspokenness that women are discouraged from. And we need to have conversations about how these traits along with other leadership styles, are both valid and worthy of recognition, even when displayed by women. An intersectional lens is always of interest in these conversations, and so I'd encourage us to bring forward all perspectives in our large and small group conversations, as the goal is to bring together women identifying individuals and allies to discuss challenges, learn from each other, and build capacity to overcome systemic and psychological barriers. With no further ado, I'd like to introduce our guest of honor, Rebecca Ripa, to get us going. As I mentioned, Rebecca is the EVP of Clinical Support and Performance at University Health Network. Rebecca is a longtime leader within the healthcare community, first in Hamilton and now in Toronto. A force to be reckoned with, she has rich insights into how sponsorship, mentorship, and allyship have influenced her career. And I'm so looking forward to hearing more about her story tonight. Over to you, Rebecca. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you, Sarah and Teresa for organizing this. These are two women who have an incredible amount of energy. And actually, when I saw the series and they um, asked me to participate, it was just so right on point in terms of what I think uh, so many of us have experienced in our career and, and continue to experience uh, as uh, as leaders. And so I'm like, so happy to do it. And when I look at who's on the screen, I recognize so many of the names and, uh, and it feels a little bit like a friendly chat tonight. So I want to um, start by thanking uh, uh, everyone for taking the time, 8.30 at night. I thought it, initially, I thought it was a really, really smart time. And then as I started to get into watching CNN, I thought I better set an alarm so that I remember to <laughs> come back to the computer. So you know what I wanted to do? I wanted to start off and show you uh, a little bit around roles and and um, talk about sponsorship, because I have to tell you, there isn't a single role that I have had that I didn't get because I had a sponsor. And I want to say there's one missing from there. I can't believe I can't find it. it, it and now I'm obsessive because there, I had decided I was going to collect these my whole career. And sadly, you can tell the ones that are from the 80s and the ones that are from the 90s. Um, you know, big hair was in for sure. Uh, but I think of the 10 that are should be there, uh, there seven of them I was sponsored by men and and three I was sponsored by women. And I can tell you in each one of those, the story that uh, that 
um, you know, how, I, how those came to be. And I would say in, in each one of those, I have always said uh, success in moving to whatever role or level that was in the organization was based on three things. One was, did I have the skill and ability or the credentials to do the job? And so that's a given in terms of, you know, you would need that, obviously. But the second one was around being in the right place at the right time, luck. You know, you just happen to be there when the role is 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 um, necessary, and uh, the collision of those two opportunities come together. And then the third thing I would say it's being able to recognize that it's the right one because there are lots of opportunities around us all the time. But thinking about how how to do that and using the networks and the sponsorship and the mentorship and all the things we're going to talk about tonight, you know, to help you decide whether it's the right one. But it was the article from. The Harvard Business Review was so telling for me because 100%, um, uh, you know, sponsorship was absolutely um, uh, a keystone in being able to to uh, get certain roles, all the roles. And then somebody sent me this, which I thought was just so telling as well. Uh, and I think it's something, you know, we're all here tonight. So this is an example of surround yourself with women who would mention your name in a room full of opportunities. And there was another one in here that I was going to share. I took it out because I'm, uh, I know we want to get to, I didn't want to have a lot of slides, but it really was, you know, we have a role and responsibility to support each other. We have so many opportunities as women and, and the women who went before us to make sure we had those opportunities. And so it's so important that we support each other in whatever those are, because we're lucky to have as many as we do and being able to find those opportunities uh, and being able to help find the right opportunity for the right time in your life is so key. So uh, I think that the second takeaway is fi find your squad, uh, who, who are your cheerleaders and your supporters. And then, I, you know, if I go back to that, the, the three things that I think were important, a sponsor, you know, luck, being able to recognize the opportunity and having the skill and ability, you know, we're, we're great at, at making sure we're credentialed. And I'll often have the conversation with people where they'll say, maybe I should do my project management certificate, or maybe I should do my, and, and I think it, it is less about like, we're, we always are great at credentialing, it's never going to hurt you. But it's not necessarily the thing that's going to move you forward. And on the mentorship size, knowing if the opportunity is right for you really comes down to understanding what your core values are, understanding what your brand is, and I'll kind of like circle over here, what you do and what you say and how, how people feel, like what are you about and really understanding what you bring beyond your skill and ability as a leader, knowing who the people who you want to be superheroes with, and then understanding how you're going to network them all together. And in the article, and I'll summarize it at the end, but the, you know, the takeaway from this one is in that mentorship role, that's where this work is done. The mentorship or the strategizer role where people can help you understand, you know, what's important to you in a work day, who are the kind of people you like to be around. Some of us were chatting before we started tonight on just the whole um, infrastructure that COVID has now put on us where we don't have those opportunities to connect physically anymore. We we don't have the uh, the coffee time, the, build, uh, the ability to go up for dinner. And if you look at how men network, it's very different than the way women network. And it's very different in terms of the amount of time and the kinds of activities they can, they can dedicate towards it. And so I, I think this is really, really important work to do, understanding who you are. At the end of the day, I would, uh, and you know, I drive to Toronto from Niagara and, and when I took the job, uh, every single person said to me, oh my gosh, you're going to drive? Do you think you'll live there? And every single time I said, well, you know what, it's an hour drive and, and it's not, I, I've got my head around it. The drive's not really a big deal. But really what is the real story is I would rather spend 10 hours a day doing something I love with people who I love to be with and drive two hours a day in a minute if I was making a choice. The drive for me, I use the time, I found a way to be efficient with it, but it is really around being in an organization, an academic organization, and, and doing the kind of work that I love and working with the kind of people who I'm stimulated to be around. And that for me 
is hands down, I'd rather spend my time uh, if I have to drive to that to do it. So I would say it's important work and mentorship's a big part of that. So this was in your article. So the mentor provides advice and support or coaching. And that's what I think I was just referring to. The strategizer is the person who helps you in the organization figure out, you know, what are the politics? Who are the, who are the power brokers in the organization? You know, where do you want to be? They help you understand it in the context of the environment in which you're working in. Again, an important person, especially when you're new in an organization, it's the, you know, give me the lay of the land and, and tell me, um, and tell me who, who the decision makers are. The connector, and I know we all play this role because I see us doing it, especially in the virtual world all the time, uh, is connecting people for a virtual copy. Uh, can I connect you on this topic uh, in making an introduction um, and something, again, that that we're all very comfortable doing. And I would say probably everyone on this call does one, two and three. The four and five was interesting for me because the opportunity giver is the one that provides the high visibility opportunity. And the advocate is the one that will uh, fight for you when when you're not in the room, who when the door is shut. And and I think those are two key things because this article really got me thinking about the fact that why is it that seven out of ten of the roles that I've got really came through a sponsor of a male and what were the opportunities and how and, and in my role how am I making sure that I'm the opportunity giver or the advocate versus I think what I thought I did a lot of was the mentoring and the connect. And so it is it, it fundamentally when, you know, I don't want to take a lot of the time, but I, I want to talk about the findings, like the findings of that uh, Harvard Business Review were uh, a line versus staff role. So men are more likely to be in line roles throughout their careers. They're more likely to have large budgets and they're more likely to have more direct reports. And so they, they, by, by power, by size, they have more visibility in the C-suite. And the article speaks to, and it makes total sense, that women ebb and flow between line and staff roles. And quite often, the power role is in the line. And so when it comes to what are, where are the opportunities for advocacy or for, uh, for sponsorship, they're in jobs where the in line roles. And so in many cases, that's exactly was my experience. I ended up um, with people who had large line budget roles who were able to find opportunities for me within it. And I often have this conversation about, you know, when you're in a line role, you have people in budget. And when you're in a staff role, you have to be an influencer. And so it is much easier to be a sponsor or an advocate when you've got budget to do. And more men are in those roles. Women have fewer in, in interactions with senior leaders outside of their direct management. And again, that comes back to really number one and the kinds of roles that women typically have been in. We tend to prefer, if you look at the second article, we tend to prefer to be in roles where we're an educator, where we're, we're a mentor and less in sort of some of those higher, what's perceived and discussed in the article, some of those power broker roles. And this is kind of key. Women tend to be over-mentored and under-sponsored. And, and it's for whatever reason, I don't know that, A, we even understood the role of or how to use your, uh, um, use your network around you to help you be sponsored more. So I hope we can talk about this that a bit tonight. And sponsors should be the most powerful person who knows you and your skill set. And so when you think about that, identifying those people and then and then finding a way to create your brand or demonstrate your skill set is kind of the work that we have to do when this to make it easier for the sponsor to find those opportunities and that women who are mentored by men make more money and get more promotions have better career outcomes and it's not because men are better sponsors it's because traditionally and historically men have been and more in power in the workforce. And so when we talk about sort of multiple things around women in leadership roles and getting more women on boards and, and being able to promote women in positions of power, I, I, I had some sense of, you know, you don't want to get the job because you're the woman, but having the job allows you then to have and make room for more women to grow in those roles. 
So I wanted to talk about what I thought were three, the three T's that I said, table, titles, and total comp. You know, as a sponsor or an advocate, here are three things that I think are really easy to do and maybe for discussion. Getting people to the table. You know, having visibility at the C-suite, having visibility around your skill and ability and letting you start to create your brand, getting you to the table. Quite frankly, you know, there's this, there's, um, you know, this is easy and cheap to do and why we wouldn't open that up to people to be able to, to come to the tables and ask them, you know, what would you like to learn about? Where would be a good opportunity for you to hone your skills? What kind of um, position would you like? I think these are great ways as well to let uh, junior people in the organization help set agendas, help do minutes, help pull packages together, all the things that help them engage in the work a little bit. And, th and that's an area that I think we all can do. Titles. It seems like private sector's got their head around titles a lot better than public sector. Uh, we, we, we don't necessarily give freely some of the titles that would allow people to have that position power to feel that they would be able to negotiate. Somehow we hold that back a bit. Uh, you see it much more in the private sector. There's lots of VPs of smaller um, divisions and we would all look at them and say, wow, I have like a way bigger portfolio, but they've recognized that that title allows them to get through doors that they might not otherwise get through. And then the last I would say total comp. So again, um, ensuring that uh, there's equity in total comp for women, for, for roles of the same responsibility, women or not, junior or not, Total comp is a way that we can ensure that uh, that we are um, showing equity and transparency in the workplace that's helping to promote an equity amongst men and women. And so I think um, those are three easy ways. Well, not easy ways, but there's three ways as leaders that we can engage in some of the sponsorship if we're not if we don't have big portfolios to be able to um, actually provide advo uh, advocacy or jobs. So I know we're going to break out into the breakout rooms and that's where kind of I think all of the pearls of wisdom will be. But I think some questions that came to mind were, you know, what type of roles have you played for others? And can you identify your sponsor, mentors or allies in your your life? Like what is there a, a story you could tell about where you really were at your very best in terms of being able to play that role for someone? And what types of supports are you wanting to further nurture as part of your career development? What do you need to find your sponsor? And how do we find these supports within and, and outside of our existing networks? And I will just want to comment on that one. And what commitments are you making for yourself to advance your role? And, and I think when I look at number four about the existing networks, so this is an opportunity to build a network. But the easiest network to do, it's like shooting fish in the barrel. And a lot of you tonight are from McMaster, is where you went to school. It's an easy first connection that, quite frankly, will get you probably a phone call. And... Um, I had a, a, a colleague who shared with me uh, around how she reached out on LinkedIn in the early, early days before LinkedIn was really a tool. And instead of looking particularly for a job, she picked 10 um, sponsors who she thought would be people she would want to work with. She sent them 10 messages on LinkedIn. She asked them if they would just have a conversation with her on the phone. Nine out of 10 said yes. So I have to say that I think those networks are there. And I know some people feel like they're probably broaching on boundaries that they shouldn't. But for the most part, I would say most people won't say no to you. And so I would encourage you to, to um, look for those opportunities to look for your sponsor.